convert the menu from the old sort of menu that depended on there being a, uh, an actual menu button on the Android device to sort of the newer style, which has a, a option on the um, action bar. And I worked on this for a while today, till I kind of came to the conclusion that I don't ever want to take an application that was written not to use an action bar and to convert it to use one. So what I did is I created a new application and cut and pasted code. And I have updated version of Eclipse and updated version of libraries and all that. So what I like to do as promised is to um, demonstrate um, what I did to get that to work and uh, view the new menu scheme. All right. So that'll be our first task for today. So here it is. I go and run it and it works as before with the exception that the menu is now up on the action bar. So if I press that, I get the two choices of select number of choices and select region. I pick that and the rest works the same. Oops, I already did. Oh, I didn't do regions. So I can go in and do that. Um, so, and again, if you're, if you're starting off with, um, you know, if you're starting off and you start off uh, with the newer version, with the newer libraries, and you created um, this as, as a blank activity which creates it as being an action bar activity, then you won't have the, the, the trouble that I ran into. Um, when I tried to take it and uh, when it was not written that way and try to convert it. I'm convinced it was possible to do it and I'm convinced I was about this far off from having it work, but I did get it work this way. Let's review because there's not tons of differences, but there's a couple differences between the way this is and um, this, if anything, is a little more flexible of a solution. First of all, the difference, as you recall, is in the other version, we did not have a menu XML file. We simply added items to the menu. Here we have an options XML file. And that options XML file consists of a series of items. And that options X XML, we assign I uh, IDs to the items just like we assign IDs to anything else. Those will be the IDs that we use in our code to identify which option was selected. All right. So that's our XML for the menu. We then on create options menu, that works the same. This will get invoked now when they hit the button up here. because it's an action bar now. So it gets invoked when I hit that button up there. But what we do is we create our menu and we do it by a technique that's more consistent with how we've created dynamic stuff in the past. That is we use an inflator. So we use a menu inflator and we inflate the options menu. And then we simply return true. So we get instead of what we had before, the, the list of things at the bottom, we get a list of menu options um, stemming from the top. Last thing that we needed to change is we needed to change the um, on option item selected. 
If you remember before, we defined our own IDs. And when we created the menu items, we supplied them with IDs. And that's how we could tell which men menu item got selected based on the IDs. Well, now we're defining the IDs a different way. We've defined the IDs as part of the XML file. So what I'm doing in my case statement here is I'm looking at the option selected and I'm doing a switch statement on the ID of it. And if the ID equals our ID choices, which again was the ID that I created in the options menu for the first one, then it makes that selection. If it is the other one, re ID regions, then that selection kicks in. And in either case, we go in and do what we did before. So just a different way of doing the menus than the way that was done in the example, this being a more modern way. The trouble comes into, again, based on what platforms you're going to support. Um, because there's some limitations in the earlier versions of the platforms, and there's some classes that sort of allow you to adapt that. That's what these app compatibility libraries are that some of you may have seen when you've created it. And you have to specify in your style the theme that you're going to have for that. In this case, I've said my app theme is going to be um, a particular built-in theme within um, Android, uh, Android compatibility um, light, light theme, dark action bar. So if you notice the, 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 um, the action bar going across the, st uh, going across the, the top is, is dark. We can actually go and we can customize it because the further on down in the versions that you get, the more um, options you have as far as that action bar. So you can actually go in and, and how do you do that? Well, you can put it in your versions file. So for a particular version, you could define um, a list of values um, and one of those values could be the theme. So you could, for later versions, use a different theme that was cooler looking. And for older versions, use an older theme. In this particular case, because of the version of the tablet that I was running on, it told me I had to use an app compatibility theme. So therefore, I went and did that. All right. Um, most of my struggles in getting the other one to work was involved in trying to configure the build path. And in the build path, to go in and add this, I, w I was going in and adding other projects and so on. And I never did get that down completely. Ah, the and under Android uh, dependencies, I um, this is what I was trying to do, and and this one was configured correctly from the start, where I would, um, um, where it was using the compatibility v7 jar file correctly, and. In that way, it was able to, to put an action bar um, for this um, application. So, bottom line is the menu is created differently. It gets inflated from an XML file. And the second part is that it, um, the, the way that we select the ID is different because we don't assign an ID the way we did in the previous example. We, we test the ID that it's going to get from the XML file. Any questions about this? Um, I want to talk a little bit about how this works this particular application works the rest of the way. Because we've talked about the 
things that were really different about this guy. All right. That is, we talked about the menu. We hadn't seen a menu before. And we talked about um, the, um, the animation. But we didn't go in to see how the rest of uh, the application worked. Before we do that, though, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your next homework assignment. All right, uh, Lab 6, which I just posted today. Um, we are going to, uh, again, one of the beauties of being in a small class is that we have room to experiment with stuff and we can try things and see how it works. What I want to do is I want to create, and this is something that we might take a few weeks on, but I want to create a little blackjack application. First of all, and, and I'm asking this in all sincerity, is there anyone that has an issue with blackjack due to personal beliefs about gambling or anything like that. Okay. Uh, is everyone familiar with the rules of blackjack? No? Okay. Um, I, can, I can talk with you. It's a card game. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the rules of it uh, after class. It's pretty straightforward. It's, used, it's done with the standard deck of cards. And the goal is to get as close to 21 as possible without going over. And if you get closer to 21 than, you're, than the dealer does, then you win. All right? And we'll talk about the, the details of that. Um, we, we can spend a few minutes talking about after class the details of that. And, and I'm, I'm sure folks can help you out with that. The reason I ask is because, um, honestly, uh, one time I, I picked a very innocent activity for one of my classes of, of making custom birthday cards. And one of the students in my class was of a particular religious that did not believe in celebrating birthdays. Um, I forget which sect that is. Seventh-day Adventist, maybe? I don't know. It was, it was one of those sects that, that doesn't believe in, 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 in celebrating birthdays. So she asked if she could like customize a thank you card or, or something different like that, and I'm sure. So if any of you would have an issue due to gambling, then, then we can talk about other options. Maybe Jehovah Witnesses, right. Right, yeah, I, can't, I couldn't, couldn't recall the uh, exact sect that, that did that. At any... I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is just, this is just going to be straight up play your cards, dead, play their cards. It's not going to be like involving like betting more. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay. We'll see. We could, we could possibly expand this. I don't this. have a problem with that. I'm just okay, right. Yeah. The first pass of this is I just want you to play a hand and say if you won or lost. And then we'll talk about, and again, we can be dynamic with this. We can see how it goes and how the rest of the class is doing with it. And we can enhance it or, or uh, roll it back, depending on, on the requirements. So, for example, for the first pass, you know, you don't have to show, like, a picture of the card. You could say four hearts, you know, two spades, ace, diamonds, you know, just the words for that. All right? What I want for this lab assignment, which is due next week, is I want a design. And what I mean by design is I want you to identify what components you're going to need to build. All right? And the possibilities, of course, would include you're going to need a layout GUI. All right. So you're going to need something to display your activity in. All right. You're going to need uh, a main activity. All right. Minimally, you're going to need those two things. All right. Your GUI is going to need minimally two buttons. A button to hit and a button to stand. You may create classes for some of the things in Blackjack. What are the things that you might create classes for? I'm not saying, I'm gonna, not going to say right or wrong. I'm just going to say, what are some possible things you might create classes for? The, the, logic, right? 
the dealer's logic, right? There's rules about whether a dealer has to hit or not, right? 17 and above, they stand. Below 17, they hit. Okay, you're going to need, so we, we might have a class for the dealer. We might have a class for the deck. What else might we have a class for? Player? What else might we have a class for? Well, you could probably do it several ways. I would envision the deck to have a shuffle method. And I would have envision the deck to have a give me the, the card on top of the deck method. So yeah, I would expect those things to be in the deck class. Anything else? Yeah, something that implements the rules of blackjack. In other words, um, something that indicates, you know, have I, you know, did the player go over? Did, um, if, if the player did not go over and the dealer has finished playing his round, who ended up winning? All right? Pretty simple things, but still, you need code for it. Um, you might need you might need code for or, or you might need an, a class for a card alright or not I'm just brainstorming out here Pardon me? I was thinking about, I was thinking card from the And you get what? And you get the next card. Yeah, right. So you would get a card object. Right? Okay. One key in object-oriented design, and it's similar to in database design, is that when you're going through and you're describing the process, any nouns that you say are candidates for classes or tables or entities or something like that. CRC cards. CRC? CRC. Uh, class, responsibility, Right. And then through that statement, you pick out the nouns. Pick out the nouns, the right. Verbs. So nouns become your objects. Correct. Verbs become your actions. Become your actions, right. And so on. Right. A, right, exactly. Okay. Thursday, we will collectively brainstorm this. Okay. Uh, I wanted to introduce the problem. I plan on... We can, we can go do this for a few weeks and see how it's going. If we feel that it's uh, a good exercise, we can continue it for a few more weeks to polish it up and add things. If you think about this, you could add a lot of this, right? You could add a shuffle animation. You could add a deal animation. You could add images of the cards or at least graphical representations of the cards instead of simply the, 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 the name and the value of the card. So. We can see how this goes and go from there. But minimally, I want to just play one hand of blackjack and tell me if you've won or lost. That's, that's all I want to do. And then go and play the next game. Click to play the next game, and boom, you play the next game. So I will, uh, after class, I will uh, spend a few minutes talking about um, the game and how it's played 
uh, for those of you that might be a little iffy on the rules uh, or not sure of the rules. Um, and, and we can go from there. Um, all right. So that's the plan for the next assignment. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we won't worry about splitting. We won't worry about... Yeah. We won't worry about doubling. Yeah, we'll just do the very, very basics. All right. Right. Okay. So, let's go and look at this application and let's consider the scenarios. All right. The first scenario, and again, I don't, I don't recall exactly quite how far we got on this because I kind of got sidetracked on the menu, if I remember correctly. Um, but we have our activity and let's look how what happens when we reset the game. There's a method in here that says reset quiz. I think we were looking at that, if I remember, because I do remember seeing the try catch and we talked about that. The reason for the try catch, of course, is because anything that involves going out and looking to assets or ex external files could have potential issues, so therefore we want to um, check for that. All right. We have a file name list. And this file name list we are going to prepare by looking at all the regions that we said are fair game. And if the region is fair game, we're going to include it. If the region is not fair game, we're not going to include it. Uh, one of the menu, one of the options that we had on the menu was to select regions. And if you remember, based on what we selected, based on what we clicked on for a region, we either turned on or off the the um, um, the the item in the regions map. The regions map, if you remember, was sort of a hash table where we had, and by a hash table, we, I mean there's a name of an element and a value for the element. In this case, the name of the element is the region. The value is whether the region is going to be shown or not. So through our interface and through our selection of regions from here, we set that hash table to say, yes, I want Oceania, no, I don't want Africa, yes, I want Europe, no, I don't want Asia, and so on. So this sets our region map um, uh, let, let me get the exact data type on it. This sets our region map um, um, map which maps the string of the region name to the boolean. Okay. So we loop through that region map and we look to see if we want to include that region or not. If we do want to include that region, we go and we get from the asset manager a list of all the files under that asset directory. If you remember, each region is represented by a folder in the assets um, of, of this application. So what we are doing here is we're looping through the list of regions, we're checking to see if we want to include that region. If we do, if the boolean is true that corresponds to that region name, we then go and we loop through all the different files slash images that are in that region and we take out the PNG part. So 
we get rid of the .png. So our file name list would include region dash um, name of country. So when we're done here, we will have a file list or file name list array that will include all the names of the countries whose regions we've selected. So these are the ones that we're going to choose from. These are the ones that randomly are going to get generated um, for this. We initialize total guesses at zero. We uh, initialize correct answers at zero. We clear the list of countries that are going to be on this quiz. Okay. We then go through and we randomly pick an integer in the range of number of flags. Number of flags we get from the size of that file name list. So this tells us how many countries are in play. We loop through 10 times and we grab a random number. So we're grabbing what the next question on the quiz is going to be. So we grab 10 of them. So we're, when we're done with this, we're going to have quiz country list to contain the 10 flags that we're going to ask the user about. From that giant list of all the flags that are fair game for this particular, um, for this particular um, round of the game based on the settings and the region and all that. We then grab from the list of files, we grab the file name that corresponds to that random number. Then we look to see if that country is already in the list for this quiz. That eliminates repeats. All right, so if we asked about Cuba as question one, we're not going to ask about Cuba as question five. All right, we don't want to ask the same countries over and over again. So we look to see, hey, that random thing that we picked, that random country that we picked, is it already in our list of countries for this quiz? Yes. Yeah. What would have been the upper limit on the for loop? Okay, here's the reason why. He's only incrementing the flag counter if he gets a, a country that isn't already in the list. All right? So in other words, you may do this loop. This loop could iterate 15 times because maybe five times there were a duplicate found. Whereas with a for loop, it would only increment the 10 times or whatever. Yeah. So that, that's why that's done. Then we load the next flag. So we start the ball rolling. All right. We grab the next image name and we set the correct answer to the next image name. And we clear out some text. And we display our how many right out of how many possibilities we have. We strip out the region from this. We extract the region from the next image's name. All right. As we said before, when we look at the file names, the file names are actually comprised of the region dash country name. So what this does is this pulls the region out of the file name. We then go and we're going to 
input or, or read in the image. We know that the image is in this region folder, right? So Africa, all the images for Africa are in the region folder called Africa, and their name starts with Africa. If that ever broke down, there'd be a problem. Like if you misspelled Africa in this file name, then it wouldn't know that it would that it wouldn't know that it belonged in the really the region Africa. So that has to match the folder name. So we're actually grabbing the image, and at this point we have flag view. We're setting to the selected flag for this particular question. What is flag view? Flag view is in our layout. It's that image view. Or put differently, it is this image right here. All right. So we've gotten a list of all the flags that are in play. We've looped through that list and made sure we had 10 unique flags for our questions. Now we're going in and we're asking questions one at a time. All right. So we've picked our first image to appear. We've grabbed that image and we have displayed it. Now what we want to do is we want to display the list of options. So, first thing we do is we clear all the previous rows that exist in the button row table, in the button table layout. If you remember, we could have three, six, or nine options to choose from based on the option that they selected. So this button table row, which is our button table layout, which is in our layout, could have one row, could have two rows, or it could have three rows. So we're clearing those out. We are shuffling our file list here. All right. Why are we shuffling the file list? We're shuffling the file list so that we can pick what the other options are. So if we display the flag of Poland, we have to display two other countries in addition to Poland. We'd have to display Poland and then two other options. Or if we have six, we'd have to display five other options. Or if we have nine, we'd have to display um, eight other options. So we're shuffling that. Yes? That is that is restricted to what regions are in play. Right. In other words, what we do is we loop through the region and we look to see is that region in play. If it's in play, then we loop through the list of file names and add it to that. So yeah, that's only going to have the regions that are in play. Yes. Yep. It is, yeah, method on the, the um, um, collections, and you give it a list, and it will go in, and it will it'll just randomize the list of things. Okay. So, 
we set the correct answer. All right. This is kind of this is kind of a little little bit of a trick here. We temporarily take the correct answer out of the list and put it on the bottom of the file name list. That's what this instruction does. So what this instruction does, if our list is like this, let's keep it simple and let's say we're all, you know, let's say there's only five countries, Poland, Germany, China, um, India, and Brazil. If Poland was the first flag that we're going to display, what we do effectively is we take it out of its current position and pop it down to the end. So now our list is Germany, China, India, Brazil, and Poland. That's what this line of code here does. We then go in and we use our layout inflator to crank out either three, six, or nine buttons. And again, if you remember, when we pick that option, we divided by three to get the number of rows. And we go through, we grab each table row, and we go in and we create the buttons. As we are creating the buttons, we go in and we grab either the first three, six, or nine countries. All right. Let's keep it simple and we'll talk about with three because my list of countries, there's only five of them, so we don't want to go more than, more than five. What the, lot, what the code up here does is it inflates and it makes the row, in this case only one row, and it puts, because remember we shuffled this in an earlier step, we put Germany, China, and India, we put the top three things in that as a name of that button that we've selected. So right now the correct answer is nowhere to be found in that list. Okay? Well, where do we do that? Well, in the next lines we then go in and we randomly pick one of the buttons that is displayed and change it to the correct answer. So maybe we change this one to the correct answer. Let's think of why they would do that that way. All right. They, they've shuffled them, so that guarantees that there's going to be some randomness in the other options, that we're not going to get the same ones over and over again. And it also guarantees that we're not going to get the same one twice because we're simply taking the top three off that list. Okay? So that's why they shuffle it and simply take the top three off the list. That's good enough to randomize the options. But we have to put the right option there somewhere. Right? We have to put the right option there somewhere. So we stuck it at the bottom of the list so we know for sure that in our first pass, we're not going to get that correct answer in there, right? Because we stuck it way at the bottom of the list. All right? So we know that the, all the options 
are going to come from the incorrect countries for this particular question. Yeah, we still have to give the correct country as an option. But we don't always want to make the correct country option one, option two, or option three. So we randomize and we pick and we substitute that choice with um, the, um, the, the correct country name. Thing to keep in mind, all right, is that as far as applying this to something that you're doing, assignment wise or whatever, there is a necessarily, there is not necessarily a direct correlation between all of this and what we're going to do. But it is valuable to become familiar with reading Java code to understand how this works. All right? And some of the stuff could very well be valuable. For example, maybe shuffling a deck of cards. Maybe you could use that shuffle bit to do something along those lines. All right? So when we're done, we have three, six or nine, we'll just assume three for now. We have three buttons that contain the top three from when we shuffled it, except one of them got swapped out randomly with the correct answer. Yes. Sure. Yeah, exactly. In other words, in other words, let, let's think about this. And again, keep in mind that that even if you pick the smallest, the smallest region still has fifteen or twenty countries in it. Okay, smallest region is probably Oceana, Oceana, and it has a bunch of stuff in it. So it, it still has 15 or 20. All right, so we randomly shuffle all the, re, all the countries that are in play. And by in play, I mean that they've been selected. All right. We want to make sure that we have the right answer as one of the choices. But we want to make sure that we don't have the right answer in there twice. Okay? So we're going to do this in two steps. And again, you're right. It makes sure that we don't have to do like a bunch of little if statements to look to see and all that. What we do is we in pass one, we put out there the three, six, or nine buttons that are on the top of the list that we know don't include the correct answer. Because if you remember, we shot the correct answer down at the bottom of the, of the list. So we, in pass one, we know that we have a unique set of things, a unique set of answers that doesn't include the correct answer. Then we simply randomly pick one of the incorrect answers and substitute the correct answer in. It's actually kind of clever to do it that way. I, I don't know if I would have thought of doing it that way, but it, it's a pretty clever way of doing it. And that makes sure, for example, that you wouldn't include the correct answer twice. Like if you didn't put it at the end of the list, you could shuffle it and it would happen that maybe Poland end up at the top. So you'd put Poland, China, and Germany. Then you might substitute randomly for Germany and have Poland, China, and Poland. And, and that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be good. All right.
All right. I missed this when I was going through and um, reviewing it. What's that? Right. It's not completely randomizing possible answers. Well, this code doesn't. What does randomize it is our shuffle up here. Where was that? Oh, the, yeah, yeah, you passed it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what randomizes it. In other words, you're right. We're always getting element 0, 1, and 2 there. All right, but is randomized by doing the shuffle, so each time through, 0, 1, and 2 is, is a different set of things. Yeah, uh, question or no? Okay. The one thing I did not mention as I was doing this is as it's creating the button, as it inflates it and all that, it sets the guess button listener, or it sets the on-click listener to guess button listener. And that guess button listener, if we look down somewhere, yeah, simply calls submit guess. All right. Again, the code in the listener is very thin. It calls the methods that do the job. All right. And so it's going to call and it's going to pass the button to submit guess. We're going to look at the text of the button and we're going to look at the correct answer and we're going to compare to see if guess equals answer. First of all, first of all, why this syntax? This is a good question for you Java fans out there. I use the method guess E, uh, guess dot equals answer. I have two strings. We have a string of answer or a string of guess. Good. All right. Exactly. There are, and I think we talked a little bit about this before, for all variables there are primitives, there are, or there are primitive variables and there are object reference variables. Strings are object reference variables. All right. When you compare two primitives you're comparing their values. So if I have an int x and an int y, if I say if int equals, if, or I'm sorry, if x equals y, then I'm comparing the integer value of x with the integer value of y and everything will work the way that you'd expect it to. Strings, however, are objects. So, if I were to say if guess equals answer, that would be asking are these two the same object? Do they point to the same memory? Not, are they both objects that have the same string value contained within them? All right. If you don't understand that, we can review it some more. You can answer questions, or you can just accept as a matter of faith that if you're comparing strings, do it this way, where you specify, use the equals method to compare to see if they're equal or not. 
Object references, if you compare two objects, you're asking are they the same object. You're not asking if they have the same value, whether it be a string or, or uh, a, a date or um, a employee or anything like that. You know, so if you had two employee objects, if you said if this object equals that object, you're not looking to see if they both relate to the same person, you're looking to see if they are the identical object. So, anyhow, if it's correct, we're going to go and we're going to increment the correct answers. We do our happy animations. We um, set the text of these things. We disable all the answer buttons. And if correct answers equals 10, we go in and we um, display sort of the ending dialogue that says how many questions uh, or how many questions they got right out of how many and it does a calculation of the percentage and so on. If it's wrong, we do this little delay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's not if it's wrong. If it is correct but not the end of the quiz, we do a little delay. Why do we do that delay? Well, because we don't want to say, hey, you got it right, boom. Here's the next question before you have a chance to see that they got it right. So we're doing a little delay, which actually does a pause of 1,000 milliseconds or one second. If it's incorrect, we simply go in and we set the text, disable the button that they pick so they can't answer the same thing over and over again and let them try again. This is kind of goofy how this is written whereas it goes until you get it right no matter how many attempts it takes. So you could take nine attempts on each button or on each flag to get the correct answer but it'll let you do that. Um, as opposed to giving you each question one time and, if, and then grading you that way. So, I'm not really sure why they did it that way, but they did. You know, we could make it so that after one guess, it goes to the next flag, regardless if they got it right or wrong. Well, I could, I could still do that. Yeah, if you could track, like, which one they got right and which one they got wrong and show the, the flag. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is I could do this. Um, maybe. I'm, um, what country is that? I do not know. I don't think it's Liechtenstein. So let's pick Liechtenstein. I got it right. I don't think that's the Netherlands. So I could tell them no, and I know that I got it incorrect. Pause a second and then go on to the next question. So they would know wrong. But you're right, when they're done, you, they wouldn't eventually learn what the correct flag was. You, you could. It all depends on your goals and all and all that of of what what the intent was for doing this. All right. Right, right. Fair, fair enough. Um, just different ways that you could you could do this. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. This does show this does show some nice things. For example, it disables a button after you've picked it if it's not correct. Um, how does it know? Well, one of the arg the argument to that function is the button, so it just disables it. All right. Any questions about this particular thing? Again, 
Keep in mind as you are doing this, you know, you're, you're not going to be called upon in this class or real life to duplicate this functionality. So the point isn't memorizing this. The point of going over these examples are, number one, look at the things that we can go and we can take and we can apply to the other problems that we're going to pick. And again, each example we have, there's some new things that we haven't done before that are important. Uh, the animation was one in this case. The menu was another one in this case. The rest of it is by and large largely just getting used to reading Java code and going through. In particular in this case the collections is something that is, is um, pretty cool and how we can shuffle the collection and all that and doing that sort of processing. Also the map that we use to have a list of regions and then associated with that a boolean that says if we want to show or hide that particular region. Questions? Thursday will be a brainstorming session for Blackjack. All right? And we will we'll go over that um, and we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll play it by ear. If, if we all want to talk as one group, if you want to break up into groups, however you want to do it, we can, we can try and we can talk about that and, and what you need to do. All right, that's all I had. A rare occasion of me being done a little bit early. I'll really take it out on the 2, 243 class tomorrow and I'll go, or Thursday, and I'll go for hours.